Hello and welcome to another session on the Mongols. Today we're going to have a look at the Mongols' way of life. In this session you'll learn two key terms to talk about the way the Mongols lived. We're going to learn eight key animals that they used. We're going to learn two ideas about grazing and why the way the Mongols grazed was very sustainable. We're going to learn two types of Mongolian food and look at one type of Mongolian music. We're also going to have a look at the Mongolian houses, which you can see on this title slide. So, take a minute, pause the video, and define nomadic and herdsman in your own words. Okay, so for nomadic, what we're talking about is moving from place to place. Although the, nom uh, the, the tribes of the Mongols had areas that belonged to their tribe... Um, families would range widely across um, many, many kilometers in search of the best uh, forage for their herds. Um, and this depended on the season and the rainfall uh, and many other things like that. That they were herdsmen meant that they kept flocks of animals and that they uh, moved these animals across the steppe um, in response to uh, where the best food was and the time of year. So think about how this connects to what we learned about last lesson, about the kind of geography and climate that Mongolia has. How does the lifestyle of a nomadic herdsman fit the kind of soil and weather, climate and vegetation available in Mongolia? So now we're going to have a look at some of the key animals that the Mongolians used for transport, milk, meat, hides, fleece, for companionship, hunting, and protection. This is the Mongolian yak. Um, long, fleecy fur, um, lovely uh, pink milk that can also be further uh, distilled into a yak vodka. Um, very nutritious meat. Yak burgers are a specialty in Ulaanbaatar. Um, and, a, and a great... Uh, stocky animal uh, with big horns uh, for uh, surviving out on the Mongolian steppe. The Bactrian camel, notice it has two humps. Um, again, really thick fur for surviving those cold Mongolian winters. Um, a great animal for transportation. Uh, the Mongols also used camels uh, as animals for warfare. Um, great for crossing uh, dry deserts. Um, but their fur is also used um, to make the felt that is used as an insulating and protecting uh, layer in the Mongolian Gur house. Camel milk, um, also drunk by the Mongols, uh, very nutritious, uh, slightly higher co uh, salt content and uh, slightly higher micronutrients than, uh, than cow's milk. Um, and because many Mongol people are lactose intolerant, the fact that it's low in lactose um, is also a positive. The Mongols also do keep, um, do keep longhorn cattle, um, which they uh, use for milk and meat and leather. Um, they also distill the, the milk um, into a beverage um, called kumis, uh, slightly alcoholic, about as alcoholic as, as beer. Um, and you can see an experiment with that in the glass. The horse is really the, uh, the animal we probably most associate with the, the Mongols. Um, and although it's eaten today widely in Mongolia, our medieval sources tell us that um, horses that were ridden in battle um, were never eaten as a sign of respect. Um, horses were really the aristocracy um, of, the, the, uh, of the steppe, um, and they weren't used to pull carts or um, undertake heavy labour. They were really respected and loved, um, so much so that when a horse uh, died, a Mongol warrior... Um, would collect some of its, uh, its fur, um, its hair, and weave it into his spirit banner as a way of um, maintaining that, that connection with his animal um, and maintaining his, uh, the animal's strength in his own life. Uh, Mongols also could use horses on campaign as a source of food, either by uh, drinking the milk uh, of the mare or by uh, eat, uh, drink, draining the blood and drinking the blood uh, as a way of staying hydrated and, uh, and fed. Notice the size of the Mongol horses. Um, these Mongol ponies, quite small, um, 
quite uh, quite long front hair. Um, the idea of this on the step is that it requires less uh, nutrition uh, in those hard winters when it's hard to forage. They'll be able to dig through the snow with their hoofs to get access to the uh, the underlying uh, grasses and herbage. Um, and they won't take as much fodder to keep fed. Goats and sheep are also used, um, particularly favoured for their uh, their wool, which can be uh, woven into carpets after being dyed. Um, and But they're also quite susceptible to those zuds we spoke about last session, um, those big winter storms. Kashmir goats as well, very uh, favoured for their fine long furs which can be woven into uh, the finest of Mongol clothing. The Mongols practice a kind of herding uh, where they mix together all of these different animals and they move across the plain not as you know single here are the sheep here are the cows here are the horses but all mixed in as you can see in this photo and there are a number of advantages to that which we'll come and talk about in a minute. So Different animals have different reproductive cycles. Um, they like to uh, give birth at different times of years. Uh, and this means that the mothers will be producing milk at different times of the year. So, uh, the, if, you're a, if you're a Mongol herdsman, this gives you two advantages. Uh, it means if you keep a herd of different animals, you're not going to be going out at the same time of year trying to manage the births of so many different young animals, um, which is going to keep you warmer and in your bed. Um, and keep you more on top of that process of birthing. It also means that you're going to more likely have milk throughout the year rather than just for that period um, immediately after one sort of animal has given birth. The advantages of the way the Mongols move across the landscape are also worth thinking about. So we saw yesterday that the Mongol soil is quite thin um, and that it's quite susceptible to uh, environmental damage. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much uh, concern these days in Mongolia about dust storms uh, and fires. So uh, if you move your herd through quickly and maybe stay in one spot for a day or two, um, the animals will eat up the woody uh, shoots of the plants, they'll manure and fertilise the ground, they'll break up the surface with their hooves, allowing any rain that comes to penetrate, and then they'll leave, and the plants will have a chance to regrow, um, seeds will have a chance to germinate in that manure, and rain will have a chance to penetrate. Um, so it's actually, these grass plants have evolved uh, to live alongside being eaten by um, these large herbivore animals. But um, if you stay in one place, you end up with too much manure, and you pollute the environment. You end up with all of the grass being eaten, not just the woody bits. Um, and you end up with, uh, instead of just the ground being a bit broken up, allowing water penetration, you end up with a quagmire of mud um, and erosion of that very, very thin layer of topsoil. Mongols also use um, falcons and eagles for hunting. And they guard their persons and their herds with these large uh, woolly dogs, the Mongolian sheepdogs. Mongolians uh, divide food into two sorts, white foods, which are dairy-based, milk, yogurts, cheeses, and brown foods, which are meat-based. Um, so here's a selection of different uh, custards, yogurts, um, cheeses uh, that you might find at a, at, a, at a standard sort of Mongolian banquet. Um, cheese can be dried on the roof of your gur um, uh, into such a, a, a hard kind of cheese that you can actually, um, you can actually crumble it um, into a powder and it will keep without refrigeration. Um, but Mongolians also enjoy soft cheeses and butters and other, uh, other sorts of dairy products of all sorts. Uh, in terms of the meat the Mongols eat, probably we're most familiar with the, kind of, with the sort of barbecue pieces of Mongolian food. Um, but the Mongols also uh, uh, like to dry their meat um, so that they can uh, transport it um, without refrigeration. And if they're making a stew, they'll use every part of the animal. Nothing goes to waste. Uh, Mongolian clothing is adapted to the cold temperatures of the steppes um, and usually consists of, a, of, a, of different layers 
of fabrics. Um, often they'll be furs or wool or uh, linen, sometimes silk as well from China. And we have a number of contemporary images as well as some uh, surviving examples of textiles in museums that help us um, put, uh, put together an image of what the Mongols wore, um, including their underwear, hats, boots and gloves. The Mongol music um, draws on uh, similar traditions to that of uh, northwestern China, uh, where there are some stringed instruments. Um, and we know that these instruments existed uh, during this time because we've got a few examples um, in the grave. You can see that on the right of this, this skeleton, um, something very similar to the sort of modern stringed instruments that are used uh, in Mongolian music. The more but famous probably, uh, sort of music is the Mongolian throat singing. Quite something, eh? So just take a minute to record how that makes you feel. What does it make you think of? Now we're going to turn to the Mongols' housing. Um, this is what Marco Polo, a, a traveller from uh, medieval Italy, who visited the court of Kublai Khan uh, in the uh, late 1200s, um, saw when he visited Mongolia. So the Mongolian gur uh, is made of a lattice framework, a doorway, a roof piece, um, around which are layered different bits of fabric. Um, inside, uh, this will be furnished with carpets, um, a stove or a fireplace, um, couches, chests and cabinets and boxes, um, and the family's possessions. Um, and you can see that uh, with a, a family, one of these girls could be put together um, in a little bit under an hour, perhaps, um, and would have provided, because of its round shape, great protection from the wind um, and the elements in Mongolia. Today, um, they're a little bit more high-tech. Satellite dishes, solar panels, or wind power um, provide all of the, uh, the comforts of home on the steppe and access to things like Korean pop dramas. Um, and inside, you can see how there's room for the whole family. Some of the facilities, though, can be a little bit basic. The uh, arrangement of how people sit in a gur is quite important. So men and women will sit on different sides, and the most senior man, the patriarch of the family, will sit at the point furthest away from the door, opposite the door, um, and then men will sit... Uh, around on his right in order of seniority and importance. If you think about it, it makes sense that the, uh, the closer you are to the door, the younger and le uh, less senior you are, uh, and thus the, the closer you are to the cold outdoor winds. 
Um, and when you want to pack up your gear, um, you can put it either in the back of a truck or um, on the back of your camel cart and take it away with you to your next campsite. Um, nice little video here of how to set up a Mongolian gear, but you're also going to have a, have a go at setting one up.